So the next thing we're gonna do is grind the blade. And I think this is the most skill intensive part of the whole build. It just takes a lot of feel and it's taken me a lot of hours of practice and a lot of ruined knives to get to this point. So make sure you do it on a cheap piece of steel before you start and grind in Damascus. But right now we're just marking the edges with Sharpie so that when we scribe these center lines, we'll be able to see where those lines are at. We then take it to this flat piece of countertop and measure the thickness with the height gauge and divide that thickness in half and run that edge, the scribe, along the front of the blade while it's on that flat surface and this will perfectly mark the center. You don't have to get it exactly in the center because we're going to flip it over and then do the other side and sometimes when they're not in the center it just gives you a better idea because you have two small lines right next to each other but you can kind of see there where that line shines up and we're going to use that for our reference as we grind the sides in flat and flush. So to start off grinding the blade, I'm going to use an old 60 grit belt and break the edges on the knife. And the reason for this is it's very important to use new belts when you grind blades to keep everything cool, keep it from grabbing and to get a clean grind. And when you put a brand new low grit belt like 36 grit or 60 or whatever you use, that sharp edges of that newly profiled knife can wear it out real fast by kind of breaking, cutting off the new grit so just breaking it real quick with an old belt will help your belt to last a little bit longer and what i usually do is whenever i do a new blade i will take and put all brand new belts on and then i will use those belts after they've ground the blade to do the profiling and non-critical operations on the next knife right here i have this file guide got it from bruce bump who is the man um i basically i don't grind with these anymore i never did end up using them that much but it's super handy for marking out your grind lines uh, you just put this on and then mark on both sides and you have perfectly even lines to reference to while you're grinding i don't think there's any shortcut to grinding blades well i freehand all mine and in my opinion grinding a blade is probably the most skill critical or skill intensive part of making a knife. It's just super hard. There's really no way around it. And you can use jigs and stuff all day, but I don't think you're ever gonna truly be able to make a good knife until you can freehand grind a blade. And that just takes some time. So I'm not gonna bore you with a bunch of grinding here, but I just try to show some progression, even some swoops and fixing them and just going through the belt grits. There's that swoop I was talking about. That just happens with a little bit of not paying attention, but easy to fix. Just keep some even pressure and go over it a couple times and it's gone. So here I'm just going up to the next grit and I'll usually go up to about 600 grit and finish off with these Norax gator belts, which give a really flat even finish to help with transitioning to hand sanding. So right after I got done talking about how you shouldn't use jigs, I'm now using a jig. But 
Actually what I'm doing here is these swedges and part of grinding, getting a flat even grind on these flat platens is being able to index off of the flat surface. So knowing when your blade's flat to the belt and that's a lot harder to do on these tiny swedges. There's only a, you know, a couple millimeters of space there. So I use these jigs, just makes it a lot faster. I can do it by hand, but I have to take a lot of time and it's a lot more stress so I, I like using this jig this one's from dd workrest and his stuff's fantastic all tig welded it's nice stuff uh here's a small wheel just finally doing the part you've all been waiting for if you have a sharp eye you've noticed that extra meat right there this whole video and i am now grinding down to that line on the choil coil whatever you call those um, and this part's satisfying because now you can look at the plunge lines and see how nice and even they are so smooth now on to the best part of the whole build the hand sanding and this is what I look forward to the whole time because it's so awesome but really it's not it's the worst and it takes uh, a lot of time but if you do a few things to prepare you can make it a lot easier on yourselves and uh, I guess my tips would be one I mentioned earlier I go up to 600 grit on the grinder and then I start hand sanding at 400 grit and this I usually go a grit lower on the hand sanding than I was on the grinder and this just helps that first initial pass which is the most difficult one to go a lot quicker like this hummingbird speed um, but really that and then also keeping taking your time on the grinder to keep everything completely flat and not just going to the next grit and thinking you'll fix it later it's probably the biggest mistake you can make because it's just going to make everything compound and take twice as long so come off your grinder perfectly flat and even and when you do this with the uh, hand sanding you'll get results like this where it's nice and even and perfect so you can start to see the pattern and that's always so after you hand sand then I take it back to the flats and I clean those up and I clean those up last because I put them on the trisect gator belts on my grinder and I hold them with this magnet and what that does is you kind of inevitably wash out the lines a tiny tiny bit when you hand sand and putting them just on this flat surface helps to crisp everything up and have really nice clean transitions. And obviously that paper towel is there to protect the blade from the metal parts of the magnet and scratching it up. So we're essentially ready to etch now. So now it's on to the other parts of the blade. Right here I have the bolsters on the liners so I can basically smooth out the milling marks on the zirconium and then I'm going to put it in the sandblaster and we're going to just get a nice even sandblast which makes it look nice when we heat the zirk up and turn it nice and dark black here. It kind of looks gray once we clean it up, put some WD-40 on it, it goes black. I always like coloring zirconium, uh, especially on these type of pieces. I'll try, I like to do kind of an oil slick where it's just a variable color and it really plays in the light. It looks cool. So you can see how those turn pretty black once you clean them up and put the WD-40 on them. So Zerk is obviously pretty nice in these builds. So we're done with darkening those parts they're kind of finished for now so we'll let those kind of dry off over here and uh, just get to the next thing as far as going over each piece and just finishing it to the kind of end stage for final assembly so here I have a piece of I think this is 120 grit sandpaper on a granite surface plate. This is actually the quartz cut out from our countertops, but uh, just a flat surface that we can take the liners and 
clean them up on both sides. They get pretty beat up during the building process and heating and all kinds of stuff. So I use a little WD-40 for a sanding fluid and just go over both sides. So after we get the liners sanded and evenly finished, we're going to bring them over here and set up the anodizing so we can turn these a nice coppery goldish color. I don't normally anodize a lot, but sometimes I do it in a more subtle way just to kind of set things off. And where this is this old expensive mammoth tooth, it's kind of more a classier build in my opinion. So I think the bronze goldish color will set it off. Here I'm adding the TSP which just acts as a electrolyte which will transmit the electrical current to help with the anodizing. I added way too much. Uh, I hadn't done it in a while and forgot but remember a little goes a long way with electrolyte so too much like this and it kind of gets it all gummy but I think I cleaned it out at some point and it worked a little bit better. Here you can see the difference in color. Uh, I had way too much TSP in my water, so it was hard to tell while it was anodizing. The it's hard to see the color change, but you can see how they're that kind of bronze color now. So right here we're kind of jumping back in time. You'll notice on the rest of the parts, but this is when I made the clip, and essentially I had. This piece, I actually already water jet cut out. Sometimes whenever I get my liners water jet, I'll get a few clips done. And uh, this one's zirconium as well. Actually, I don't think I water jet cut this. I think I cut it out myself. I can't really remember. Anyways, what I'm doing here is just, uh, we're gonna drill one of the holes in the back of the clip and then uh, line it up with the hole on the scale and put the screw through it so that we can then place the second hole. I, I feel like trying to put both the holes in the clip and both the holes in the liner and the scales and then hope they line up. I mean I'm sure it'd work and some, I'm sure some people do it that way but it's easy to kind of get things. If one of the holes is just a tiny bit off the clip is all cockeyed and looks goofy so and sometimes if I want to do a different type of clip or change something I can't if there's already the holes drilled so I typically wait to drill one of the holes until afterwards. We're just grinding away at the clip here. I have that scribe line similar to what I did on the blade and I'm just going to grind close to that. Uh, one maxim is never grind all the way to your line because you're going to end up way past it when you're smoothing things out so grind close to it and then when you smooth it out you're going to get right up to the actual line so that's what I'm doing here. Also I keep taking it away from the belt and you'll notice it's wet. These things get super hot super fast and it's a small piece so I'm holding it with bare hands. There's not really a good way to hold it otherwise so I'm just continually cooling it as I grind it and you can kind of see the water boil off as I put it back on. So once we're done with a small wheel, I'm going to put the flat platen on and grind some of the flat parts with it. You'll notice there's tons of sparks coming off this, super bright sparks, and that's because this is super flammable when you're subjected to heat. 
So it's kind of interesting actually when I bought this, you have to sign a waiver when you buy it that they can track you wherever you are when you buy it. And I kind of looked it up and I think part of it is because it's using nuclear reactors because it does not absorb neutrons. So if you do not want your knife to absorb too many neutrons, then make sure to get some zirconium on your knife and you will be set. Once we're done grinding that clip and coloring it like we did in those other clips, then it's on to etching the blade and after all that hand sanding, you really don't want to pooch this part because then you have to go back and do all that hand sanding again and I've done that plenty of times. This is my ferric chloride. I probably should not be touching that with bare hands, but I'm still all right, so it worked out. But it's just, it, once it's sitting there for a while, there's obviously acid in there. It kind of dissolved that little paper thing. I don't want that in the solution, but just pour it in a glass jar plastic lid don't use any metal if you use a metal lid for these they'll melt away and it's a giant pain also don't spill this because it will evaporate and rust everything in your shop so i don't even etch the knives in my shop i'm just diluting it here with water and you don't have to dilute it but it just changes how fast it etches so i dilute mine a little bit just so it's not too fast this fantastic contraption, I uh, got the idea from uh, Birch Tree Blades. I think his name is Michael Birch. Uh, and it's basically just some neoprene washers. I cut them out and then there's titanium washers or discs over top of them. And this prevents the acid from getting on the uh, bearing pockets, the pivot surface, or the... Uh, detent ball track and because you don't want acid on any of that because if it etches in there it makes it obviously not work very smoothly and you can use like nail polish and stuff but for ferric chloride nail polish works all right but if you use muriatic acid which is what i normally use on uh, damastil it just eats the nail polish right off it doesn't even do anything so this is super nice you don't have to clean off anything after you just unscrew it um uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite new things I've been using on my knife. So next step is to clean it super good just with plain sink water. You just want to clean any kind of WD-40, any residue off it. It's obviously okay to have a little bit of water on it when it's going into the acid because there's water in there anyways. So just leave it in for a minute and then start to see the pattern. So once you get out of the acid, you're going to take and dip it into this baking soda and water solution, which will neutralize that acid and essentially arrest the etch at that point. Also, you don't want to be dripping acid all over the place because your wife will not be pleased. But we're going to take it in and clean it off and go to the next step. Uh, you'll see here that when you etch it, it forms these oxides. And if you rub the blade at this point, then you just totally disrupt those oxides and make it all muddy looking. But don't be alarmed because in this particular etch, I'm using ferric chloride and we're going for depth for these few, first few cycles. And this is just the way I'm doing it on this blade. Um, if I just wanted a straight contrast without too much depth, I'd use muriatic acid. They just etch differently. And you figure that out by just doing it a bunch of times so what we'll do is we'll sand it and then we'll go back and etch it another cycle and we're using like a 2000 grit sandpaper so it's really only taking the top off and as we do this multiple times it'll start to get some depth and contrast and give it a really cool look that I think will go well with the mammoth tooth that we're using on this so I'm gonna spare you the whole cycle but we'll go through that off camera and get to the next point so we're ready to mark it and sharpen it and all that good stuff. Man, I wish I could just edit out sanding in real life. But there it is. Done with the first sanding session, ready for like the next eight cycles. Here we are after we went through all the sanding and etching and everything and we are ready to put the maker's mark on it and I use a electro etching system. I built that box, I'm not going to say myself because my cousin and uncle who know way more about electronics than me 
actually pretty much built it for me while I watched. I had some diagram that they followed and I bought all the parts, but it was like 40 bucks from Radio Shack instead of like 300 for buying one. So it was a good, good steal and it works great. But I bought the marker and you basically just take a resist or a stencil, the shape of your mark or whatever you're etching and tape it onto the blade and then use another electrolyte solution. There's specific ones that are made for these blades and you soak your marker in that and then just put it on the stencil and push that yellow button which basically just turns it on. You'll see that red switch there and that switches between AC and DC and uh, AC like will turn it black and then DC will actually eat away the material so first you do it on DC and eat away the steel to give it some depth and then you switch it to AC and turn the portion that you've eaten away black so that it has some good contrast so you'll see me kind of doing both here So through trial and error and some practice, you'll get a feel for how much you need to do of either cycle. And right here, you'll see me peeling back to check the mark. You'll notice how I keep that bottom tape stuck down as I check it. And this is because if you look at it and it's not etched right or deep enough on one side, you can lay it back down and kind of touch it up as long as you keep that bottom tape in the same spot and don't peel it off. It's impossible to line it back up if you take it all the way off and you're kind of hosed. In that situation because you can't put it back on and you have to either refinish the blade or have a janky looking mark so keep that bottom tucked in tight So here I'm just setting up for sharpening the blade and this is just a little piece of metal I welded into a T shape and drilled a hole in it. But that clamp there is from a Lansky which would take a lot longer to do this. And I've kind of perfected my process with the belt grinder. It takes a little work. If you're not careful you can ding your uh, flat part of your blade or your Ricasso with it and that really sucks so I go up through 220 600 and then I strop with a leather like you saw there and the blade is etched sharpened and ready to roll so we have ourselves a cutting knife that now we just gotta put it together I almost forgot I still had to heat color these screws the little hardware holding everything together and this will just help it to match that color of the liners and kind of give everything a cohesive look pull it together and this is a perfect example of real life making a knife because you keep thinking oh now i'm done but then you remember these tiny little details that you have to do and a lot goes into all these details to make everything look good so we got those all colored and we got the pivot barrel nice and polished and we're just cleaning off each separate piece as we kind of get ready to put it together into the final knife. So a lot goes into this last little bit and it's kind of nerve wracking but also exciting to put it together and see the finished product and see how it works.
And just like that, we are done. Man, each knife is such a journey, I guess you'd call it. I have a problem my wife will tell you that every time I start a project, I think it's gonna take about one-tenth the work and time as the next one. And maybe that's the thing that keeps me doing more projects and making more knives because sometimes you get to the end of these and wonder how you made it through. But this one turned out great and it's good to see it finished and ready to go off to its new home where I hope the buyer appreciates it and all the hard work that I put into it. I think it turned out awesome. Yeah, a lot of cool materials and they came together really well. So like I said before, I appreciate you guys staying with me on this project. I thought this video would be maybe like 10, 15 minutes, but it just ended up, what is it? Like, I'm gonna think I'm gonna split it into two videos, but man, there's just so much that goes into it and I didn't even film everything. So hopefully on the next ones, you can see a little bit more of the process. I'd like to show you one of heat treating the blade and all the stuff that goes into that. So hopefully you guys can stick around and see some of the next videos. Uh, it's not just gonna be a strictly knife making channel, but all kinds of stuff that I'm going to be making and hopefully get my wife and kids involved because they love to make stuff as well and we'll be able to share that with you and you guys can enjoy it so I appreciate the support and if you get a chance I'd appreciate the uh, like and subscribe and all that jazz and we'll see you next time.